so here we go. Oh, it's a live stream. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you don't have to keep asking. Okay, so uh, <laughs> welcome everybody. We're just gonna let people enter um, uh, the seminar and then we'll start. Um, okay. I think we can start. So, um, welcome everybody uh, to be set. Uh, this week we have Masha Titova, and she's presenting Persuasion with uh, Verifiable Information. Uh, the, this is recorded. Uh, as usual, we have a one hour presentation and then 15 minutes uh, for questions. After that, we have a more informal uh, segment where we move to virtual chair. We're gonna put the link soon. And if you, everybody's welcome to join us there. Uh, just. As a reminder that um, next week, uh, we're gonna have Kai Hao Yang from Yale, and he's gonna talk about distribution of posterior squalid tiles and economic applications. And our panelists are gonna be Piotr Dvorak and Wolfgang Pezendorfer. Okay, Masha. We also welcome, uh, we also welcome panelists today. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry, sorry, Elliot and Andrew. And we also have two panelists, El Andrew Little and Elliot Lipnowski. Thank you for joining us. Um, that's what happens when you don't read a script. Um, okay, uh, Masha, um, the screen is yours. Um, you have one hour. All right, um, thank you so much. I definitely don't have a script, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I um, thank the organizers. I thank the, uh, um, everyone attending and special thanks to Elliot and Andrew. So uh, today I'm gonna be talking about persuasion with verifiable information. Uh, which used to be my job market paper, but I've made some progress since then. Now, uh, in this paper, I deal with environments, uh, situations, which I call persuasion games with verifiable information. So uh, what we have here is an interaction uh, between a privately informed sender, uh, an uninformed receiver, um, could be multiple receivers, but let's just focus on one, the sender wants the receiver to do something and metaphorically speaking, I say that um, he wants her to approve his proposal. And so the receiver is just uh, has a binary action between approval and rejection. So importantly, sender's preferences here are state independent. Uh, he just always wants the same thing. Uh, and again, importantly, the receiver is just choosing between two actions. Uh, the way that the sender communicates to the receiver is with verifiable messages. So roughly speaking, uh, a verifiable message has to contain the truth, but not necessarily nothing but the truth, okay? So uh, I think it's important to study games like this because there's actually tons of applications. So um, uh, in, my, uh, in the application that I used throughout the paper, uh, it's a familiar example from Kaminitsa and Genskov where we have a prosecutor uh, who convinces the judge uh, to um, convict the defendant, so here in all the examples in blue is the sender, in red uh, is the receiver, and underlined is kind of the message. So the prosecutor presumably in court would be presenting some, but possibly not all evidence uh, of how guilty the defendant is. Uh, you could also think of a politician convincing a voter to elect him. And then, you know, in his uh, electoral campaign, he would be making certain campaign promises, uh, which to fit in this model have to be credible. Um, and then uh, the example I used last year, that would be a job market candidate trying to convince uh, an employer to give them a job. Uh, and then, you know, when you apply for a job, you list your qualifications, um, you know, you attach test results, teaching evaluations and so on. So those would be kind of the verifiable messages you're sending. So uh, what I do here, the preview of the results uh, is uh, basically I just solve these games and by solve, I mean, I characterize the full set of equilibrium outcomes. There's gonna be multiple. Uh, and so the first thing I do is uh, I prove a revelation principle type result, which is called direct implementation. Effectively, that says that you don't have to look at all equilibria. You just need to look at the simplest possible class of direct equilibria in which the sender just tells each receiver what to do and the receiver does it. Then equipped with the direct, direct implementation result, um, 
I characterize the full set of equilibrium outcomes and I rank them in terms of the exact utility of the sender, which uh, in this setup uh, is equivalent to his exact odds of approval. And then uh, I, sh I show that in the sender worst equilibrium, uh, full unraveling takes place. So this is kind of the outcome equivalent to full disclosure. And that is the least surprising thing um, I find because you know this is a verifiable disclosure game and it's been known for 40 years now that full unraveling is something that takes place in those games. So that's really unsurprising. And then uh, what is surprising, we, I was shocked that in the sender preferred equilibrium, the sender actually reaches the commitment outcome. Um, and by the commitment outcome, I mean, you replace the assumption of verifiable messages with the assumption that the sender has exante commitment power, just like in Kamenitsa and Genskov, you actually reach the exact same payoff, okay? So uh, if, if that doesn't surprise you, let me give you an example when, the, when this does not happen. So you, when you actually do, do not reach the commitment outcome. So this, is, uh, this motivating example comes straight out of Kamenitsa Genskov. Uh, we have a state space that the defendant could be innocent or guilty. So this is a binary state space. Uh, and the prosecutor and the judge, they share a common prior that ex ante 70% of the defendants are innocent. And then the preferences are as follows. Prosecutor wants the judge to convict. So these are state independent preferences. Whereas the judge only wants to uh, convict people who are sufficiently likely to be guilty, right? So the judge here wants to match the state that's equivalent to her wanting to convict if and only if she thinks the probability of guilty is uh, at least two, uh, at least one half, okay? So uh, what happens when the center has exotic commitment power? So Kavitsa and Genskov show that the prosecutor uh, maximizes his exotic utility with the following um, signal, if you will. So first, he only actually needs two signal realizations. Uh, one is G which is interpreted as, um, you know, saying that the defendant is guilty. So that's a recommendation to convict. And another signal is I, but we don't need that right now. And so the commitment outcome he here is whenever the defendant is actually guilty, the judge is recommended to convict with probability one. So all the guilty people end up in jail. But then whenever the defendant is actually innocent, uh, they are, the judges also recommended to put them to jail with some probability alpha. Okay, so importantly, it's actually, uh, okay, so what's not important is whether the prosecutor knows the state or not. What is important is that the commitment power allows them to uh, condition the signal realization on the actual state of the world. So uh, what is alpha? Well, the judge actually needs to uh, interpret the guilty signal as a recommendation to convict. So here we calculate her posterior on guiltiness after that signal, use base rule, and we just set that belief equal to exactly one half to make the judge exactly indifferent. And we solve for alpha, turns out alpha is gonna be three sevenths. So this three sevenths is actually gonna be featured a lot in this talk, so just remember that number. But the outcome here is that basically all the guilty people go to jail, three sevenths of the innocent people go to jail, and the total of 60% of all defendants go to jail. Uh, and now that's uh, quite impressive because you know the 70% of them are exactly innocent yet 60% of them are convicted. So that's Kamenitsa and Genskov. Now, the question is, uh, can we actually uh, implement the same outcome without commitment if messages are verifiable? So we have the same setup, same preferences, and now say that the prosecutor is informed does not have commitment power, but he can send messages that are verifiable. So since we have a binary state space, we are only gonna have three messages. One is, you know, the defendant is guilty. The other one is the defendant is innocent. And the third message is, I don't know, they could be uh, guilty or innocent. And then verifiability just says that you cannot lie. So you cannot say that they're guilty, they're actually innocent. And you can't say that, uh, say that they're innocent whenever they're guilty. Now, <clears throat> The question is, can we reach the commitment outcome? Specifically, can we convict three sevenths of the innocent people? And the answer here is a very, very definitive no, because you know, if in equilibrium, the judge convicts some of the innocent people, 
then the sender in the state when the defendant is innocent is just going to deviate and try to convict all of the innocent people. Okay, so this is the play, this is the role of the commitment assumption. Commitment assumption uh, prevents you from those deviations, okay? So in fact, in this equilibrium, the verifiable information game, there's just only gonna be one in which it's fully separating, guilty people are convicted, innocent people are acquitted. So now, uh, did I lie to you when I say in the preview of the results that you actually can reach the commitment outcome without commitment because pretty transparently you cannot. Uh, and the answer here is that if you're open-minded enough to consider continuous state space, then you actually uh, can always reach the commitment outcome. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the hour on. And I'm also gonna show you how to make any binary state space continuous. So not all hope is lost, for the judge and the prosecutor. So um, let me briefly talk about where I stand in the literature. So uh, first of all, this is a communication paper. And specifically, I follow the protocol of Milgram and Grossman, verifiable information and verifiable disclosure. Now, what are other communication protocols? Well, there's Bayesian persuasion, there's cheap talk, there's spend signaling. Now, um, in Bayesian persuasion, the sender usually does better just because of that uh, commitment assumption. In fact, Elian, uh, Elliot has this paper in which they show that the sender often strictly prefers to have commitment to communicating with cheap talk. Uh, and so uh, my main contribution, the way I see it is, um, if you replace cheap talk with ver verifiable messages, actually the sender you know, reaches the same outcome. Um, so why, why is this an important result? Well, there's a lot of great applied Bayesian persuasion papers. You know, we have, um, you know, politicians and voters, governments and citizens, and a lot of other examples. Many of these papers make uh, policy predictions, but, you know, assuming that the center has commitment power is quite strong. So uh, what I'm saying here is you could actually keep a lot of uh, these, uh, the results and policy implications of being in those papers. Uh, and sometimes with slight modifications to the model, you could actually reach all the same results uh, with just verifiable messages and without any commitment whatsoever. Um, okay, so unless there's any questions, I'm gonna jump into the model. Okay, so let me talk about the model. So yes, um, sorry, Masha, I, I was yeah. uh, uh, just after a second. So uh, Jason uh, Hartland is asking, uh, in Kamenka against Go, I thought that the signaling strategy was to send innocent on one half of the innocence and innocent guilty, the sort of a pooling message on everyone else. And that gives the same outcome and is verifiable. Um. So yes, there is a discussion on how um, you could add verifiability to community and Genskov, but you still need commitment power, um, as far as I remember. But yeah, there, that I cannot make a more substantive comment uh, than that right now. We can talk about it after. You still need commitment. Jason, if you want to uh, intervene, uh, you know you can do that. Um, I'll just we're just gonna move on and then. Uh... Uh, let's see later on, perhaps. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, let me talk about the model. So we have a state space, which is a unit interval. So importantly, it's continuous. Uh, then we have a sender who's using he, him pronouns, and he privately observes the state of the world omega, which is just some point uh, on that unit interval. And then as far as the receiver knows, uh, that point is drawn from the common prior with the full support. All right, so we have, uh, an information symmetry here, sender knows the point, receiver only knows the distribution. Then the sender's preferences are state independent and without loss of generality, we say that um, he gets one if receiver approves the proposal and zero otherwise. And then the way that the sender communicates is with verifiable messages. So a message is just some subset of the unit interval uh, and then verifiability, which uh, I also sometimes call the grain of truth condition, says that whatever message you send has to include the actual state of the world. All right, so for example, if the message is that omega is between zero and one half, 
basically the receiver is going to know that it's true in a sense that omega actually is going to be between zero and one half, but he wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't know exactly where between zero and one half it is. So uh, you could think of it as lies of, of commission not being allowed. So you cannot say, say something that's false, but lies of omission are allowed in the sense that, you know, that zero to one half message includes a lot more omegas than just one. It, so, just, uh, no, it might, it, so it might be better to address this later, but it seems like in the, in the opening examples, it, it's not really the state itself that's verifiable, but some sort of facts which can situate yeah. the state. So like, yeah. You know, I can't say I'm the best job market candidate, but I can say, you know, I've published a paper in this journal. So I just, I just don't know if it's like easy to map that kind of like constituent part verifiability to the ultimate state verifiability. Um, yeah, so I haven't spent too much time thinking about it. Well, actually I have, but I haven't spent too much time actually being successful thinking about it. But uh, uh, certainly, you know, there's a connection between verifiable information literature and the evidence acquisition literature. So it's kind of like uh, you could think of this as presenting evidence. Um, and so I would have an example uh, in a second where hopefully that connection would be uh, clear. Like when the judge and prosecutor are talking exactly uh, how the evidence uh, is proving the claims. Okay, right. So that's the sender. <clears throat> Next, we have the receiver. So uh, receiver uses she, her pronouns. She has some utility function that depends on her action on the state, but we actually don't care about the utility. What we care about her net pay of approval, which is just her utility of approval, net of her utility of rejection. So that's done so that this object just depends on the state of the world. And then her best response under complete information would be to approve uh, in state omega, if and only if the net pay of approval is non negative. Uh, and then another useful object to define here would be her complete information approval set. So those are just all the states of the world uh, in which you would prefer to approve under complete information. So those with the non negative delta. Uh, and then um, standard assumption I'm making here is that under the prior belief, the receiver, uh, the receiver prefers to reject. Okay, so that's just uh, us trying to, uh, you know, actually have meaningful communication between them. Masha, can I um, ask a question? Sure. So, so it seems that here you have essentially a two action. While you have a, an infinite number of states, you have a two action space, yep. right? So yep. this is going to be important, I guess. Also, it's, I mean, uh, the, yeah. The bi binary state space is extremely important. It's actually what allows us to even write down this delta. Uh, right, because we have two actions, so this is utility of one action, negative utility of two of the second action. Yeah, okay. very important. Masha, what um, are you assuming about delta? Um, Other than the main inequality that's there, like, like, is it is it bounded? Is it continuous? So, like, um, doesn't need to be continuous. Um. Yeah, it's actually, in many of my examples, it's not continuous, um, possibly bounded, but actually I'm not assuming anything for now, but maybe I should think more about it, yeah. Um, okay, so um, how do we make a binary state space continuous? So this is our uh, attempt to bring the, the motivating example to fit the model that I just described. So now the state space is gonna be, um, no longer the defendant being innocent or guilty, but it's gonna be a range of how guilty the defendant is. So it's gonna be a range from 0% guilty to 100% guilty. Uh, and the best example I could come up with, uh, which is not very good, but uh, you could think of the crime being uh, stealing cars. And then uh, this person here stole zero cars. And then this person here stole 100 cars. And cars are perfectly divisible. Now, for the sake of this example, the prior is going to be uniform. And then the sender is going to be the prosecutor who just wants the judge to convict every defendant, regardless of how many cars uh, they stole. And then the receiver is going to be the judge. Now, in community against of the judge uh, wanted to convict uh, the guilty and acquit the innocent. So um, here, the judge is going to have some threshold of conviction. So the judge actually only considers the people who stole at least 70 cars guilty. 
and the people who stole less than 70 cars, she considers innocent. Okay, so the judge's approval set is gonna be this interval from 0.71, um, the people who stole 70, 71, all the way to 100 cars. Now, uh, why is this 0.7? Recall that in community against scope, we had the prior of innocence to be 0.7, right? So now the prior is uniform, but, um, you know, ex ante, that just means that the judge considers 70% people innocent and 30% people guilty. Okay, so, so far we're telling the same story. Now, uh, another relevant piece of information about the judge's preferences is, is of course for net payable approval. Um, so remember the judge wants to match the state. So, uh, you know, whenever she, she's convicting the people who she considers guilty, she just gets one. Um, and then whenever she convicts people she, conv um, she considers innocent, she gets negative one, okay? Because she made the, the wrong choice. So her, her utility of conviction is zero, her utility of acquittal is one, so it's zero, negative one, so it's negative one, okay? So this is uh, the example I'm gonna focus on uh, for the rest of the model. Would it work just as well if that delta was was increasing and continuous and just cross zero at point seven? Um, so that would be uh, that would not. Mm, so this would be a legitimate model, but it's not going to have the same outcome as the binary state model. So you could you the, all the results would still apply, but here I'm just trying to make a point that you could make a binary state space continuous and reach the same outcome. Yeah, but um, this is one example, of course, delta could be, uh, you know, if it's, a, for example, a voter with a bliss point, then her delta is going to be increase up to the bliss point and then decreasing. And depending on application, you know, the, the, the net pay of approval will be different. Okay, so uh, what's next? Uh, next, let me talk about um, equilibrium concepts um, and what I mean by equilibrium. So uh, what happened? Okay, so I'm looking at perfect Bayesian equilibria. So we have the sender's uh, strategy, which is he learns the state of the world, send mess sends messages. We have the receiver's strategy, which is uh, she hears a message, takes an action uh, to reject or to approve. And then the receiver also hears a message and formulates a posterior belief about what the state of the world could be. Now, of course, the sender maximizes his utility in every state. Uh, and um, subject to the verifiability constraint. Okay, so this is unique to verifiable disclosure literature. You're not gonna have this in cheap talk. You're not gonna have this in Bayesian persuasion. Uh, then we have the receiver. So the receiver's best response is to just approve. So play action one, whenever the expected net play of approval is not negative, expectation being taken with respect to her posterior. And then um, with posterior beliefs, uh, of course, they're going to be based rational on the path, but uh, because our messages are verifiable, we have another condition uh, that we place on the on the posteriors. Uh, basically, whenever you hear a message, you're not going to think that this message came from the state in which it was not available. Uh, and that's true on and off the path. So basically, when the receiver hears message that omega is between zero and one half, She's not gonna think that it came from omega being greater than one half. Again, this is unique to verifiable information literature. Now, uh, what do I mean by outcome? Um, so this actually, I, I haven't seen anybody else do this. Um, so it could look a little bit weird, but I kind of um, abstract away from the communication stage. So I kind of ignore the messages and the beliefs. So it's not the belief-based approach at all. I just focus on the, uh, what happens after all of that. And what happens is the receiver takes some action. So uh, I call an outcome alpha. Uh, an outcome alpha just specifies in each state of the world what the receiver does. And specifically alpha of omega is the probability that after the communication stage, in this omega, the receiver approved. Probability of approval, okay? So an outcome is going to be an equilibrium outcome, <clears throat> excuse me, if it corresponds to some equilibrium. Um, that's, there's no convenient formula for this yet, but this is what the paper is about. And then an outcome is a commitment outcome if it solves the following problem. 
So this could look a little bit different from what you used to in Bayesian persuasion, but uh, basically what happens in Bayesian persuasion, you know, there's a binary action of the receiver. So the sender is only going to send to uh, signal realizations, recommendation to convict and recommendation to acquit. And so then in, in terms of what I call an outcome, alpha of omega is just the probability that in this state, the receiver hears recommendation to convict. And then uh, the problem is to maximize the sender's example utility, which is they get one uh, if the receiver approves times probability of approval taken ex ante, subject to every alpha being between zero and one. And then um, what's, what's in literature called the obedience constraint that just says that on average, delta should be non-negative, okay? Um, so um, the, I think Alonso and Kamara actually have this exact um, formulation of the problem. Okay, so that's why, uh, that's what, what's an outcome. Now, uh, yeah. So you're, uh, so you're not putting obedience to choose action zero because it's, uh, because it's just a positive combination of this constraint and the prior constraint that, uh, that said that the ex ante, they want to choose zero. Very good. So yeah, um, great. Elliot, notice that we actually only have the obedience constraint for action approved. The reason why there's no obedience constraint for action reject is because there's just two actions uh, and one of one of which is sender preferred action and one of which is sender opposite of preferred action. And so actually the, the second constraint is just always gonna be satisfied. So you're basically just trying to get as many states to approve and then all the others. So the complement of that is just automatically gonna be rejected. So I don't even bother with the second obedience constraint. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> All right, so these are outcomes. Now, uh, some outcomes are much easier, much simpler than others, and I call them deterministic. So a deterministic outcome is one in which in every state of the world, the receiver takes a definitive action, which is they either reject or they approve. So they, there's never any kind of mixed recommendation. Um, and so that's a deterministic outcome. And uh, a useful concept we could define for a deterministic outcomes is a set of approved states. So a set of approved states are just all those states that end up being approved, okay? So importantly, we're not talking about equilibria yet. This is just uh, a definition for a result of that interaction. Now, um, let's, do, uh, let's do equilibrium analysis. <clears throat> So um, suppose that we knew that all equilibrium outcomes were deterministic. Now, can we think of any conditions that this set of approved states W should satisfy in order to be you know, an equilibrium set of approved states? So presumably, you know, there's gonna be some conditions for the sender and for the receiver to not want to deviate. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. Now, uh, what's the most obvious deviation of the sender? Well, you know, one thing that the sender can do in every state of the world is he could just send a singleton message that just contains that state of the world. Um, why is that, why could that be useful? Well, because when you send a singleton, the receiver learns the state. So they would, their posterior would be just one on that state. So if at the beginning of the game, the sender learns that the receiver would approve the state under complete information, then he could guarantee approval with the singleton message. Okay, so from that, we could uh, formulate what I call uh, the sender's IC constraint instead of compatibility that just says that the receiver's approval set, complete information approval has to be approved in every equilibrium or else the sender can deviate to full disclosure. So this is, notice that we're just ruling out one type of deviation. Well, so we're done with the sender for now. Now, what about the receiver? Well, you know, presumably if the receiver approved every states in W, then she thought it would, would be a good idea to approve. So um, kind of intuitively her net pay of approval conditional on W should probably be non-negative. Okay, so this is what I call uh, an obedience constraint. Now, these are just two seemingly arbitrary constraints. Now, is that actually enough to characterize any equilibrium outcome? 
And it turns out that the answer is yes. And that's my first theorem. So um, theorem one, I call it direct implementation, but you could think of it as a version of a revelation principle. Uh, and it says um, two, like two and a half, three things. So first of all, every equilibrium outcome is indeed gonna be deterministic. Uh, and then secondly, uh, some subset of the unit interval is going to be an equilibrium set of approved states if and only if it satisfies the sender's incentive compatibility as well as the receiver's obedience constraint. Okay, so theorem one just characterizes every equilibrium outcome effectively. So uh, let's prove that. Um, so uh, first part one, uh, every equilibrium outcome is deterministic. So uh, this we prove uh, by contradiction. So basically take some equilibrium that has an outcome alpha and you know assume it's not deterministic. Well, if it's not, then there has to be some state in which the receiver takes both actions with positive probability. Say she approves 50% of the time, rejects 50% of the time. Well, then uh, what's the problem? The problem is since the receiver approves sometimes, that means that in this state, the sender has access to a message that actually convinces the receiver to approve. What does it mean have access? It means that there's some message in which this omega is included and that message actually convinces the receiver. Well, that's a problem because then that fraction of the time that the sender is not convincing the receiver, he could deviate uh, and convince the receiver. Okay, so uh, it's impossible um, for equilibrium outcome to not be deterministic. Notice that this is actually the, the, the issue we ran into in the motivating example when we wanted to convince three sevenths of the innocent, but we couldn't. This is the reason why we couldn't do that. Once you're convincing a receiver, you better be convincing her with probability one. Okay. So uh, next we prove part two arrow pointing to the right. So we take some equilibrium set of approved states. So we take some equilibrium with a set of approved states W and we prove that it satisfies the two constraints. So uh, the sender's IC constraint um, we have already proved. If it doesn't hold, sender can deviate to full disclosure. Now let's prove obedience. Um, and um, the way we prove it is uh, basically we just consider all the convincing messages on this equilibrium path. Okay, so this calligraphic M are all the messages that actually convince the receiver to approve, just all of them. And then notice that if the sender convinces the receiver, so if we take some omega that is included in the set of approved states, then the sender should be uh, conv convincing the receiver with probability one. Just the same as saying you should only be sending convincing messages from that state. Now, the next observation is that actually every convincing message conv convinces the receiver. So, uh, you know, uh, by substituting her posterior, it has to be true that her net pay of approval should be non-negative after hearing that message. And so uh, it turns out that these two um, statements together if we just took a sum over all convincing messages, um, we, you know, this, this, this uh, sigma is gonna sum up to one and we're just gonna get that the delta conditional on W, expectation taken with respect to the prior belief is gonna be non-negative, right? So that's the kind of the argument I was trying to make earlier. If the receiver approved all these states, then on average, her net pay of approval should be non-negative. Okay, so this proves that uh, W should be satisfying IC in obedience. And then finally, uh, the final part of the truth uh, of the proof, which is uh, part two arrow pointing to the left. Um, and this is the part that's actually called direct implementation, right? So we take some set W that satisfies the two constraints and we prove that it could be implemented in equilibrium. Um, and I show that just by constructing an equilibrium in which this is the resulting set, set of approved states. And I prove that in the uh, kind of laziest way possible, which is uh, with the fewest number of messages possible. Uh, oh, Arda, do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I can wait until you're done with the slides, but- Okay. I'll, yeah. Sure. 
Okay, so how do we implement W? Well, uh, it's a very, very simple strategy of the sender. Whenever he learns that the state of the world is within W, he sends message W. Whenever he learns that uh, the state of the world is not in W, he sends the complement of W. And that's it, right? So these are just two, two messages that he ever sends. Um, notice that W is both the set of approved states as well as the message. Now, from the point of view of the receiver on the path, she only hears two messages, which is W and the complement of W. Now, obedience tells her to approve after W. So she kind of interprets it as a recommendation to approve. And then when she hears uh, the complement of W, she kind of obviously rejects because, you know, this message does not include anything that has a positive delta. So she just automatically is going to reject. Now, of the path belief, um, we could, uh, basically, there's a lot of beliefs that would work here, uh, but one reasonable um, example of beliefs would be a receiver being skeptical, which means that if she hears any message that is a subset of her complete information approval set, then uh, basically her belief could be anything because she's going to approve anyway, but these are not the senders who are going to want to deviate, so that's not a problem. And then whenever she hears a message that's not a subset of her complete information approval set, so for example, her entire approval set plus something else, she's just gonna assume the worst and she's gonna assume that that message came from not her approval set. And that prevents deviations from everybody who is not actually in W. So you can no longer, so this is an equilibrium. Okay, so this is how you um, directly implement some set of approved states that satisfies the two constraints. Uh, all right, there was a question. So I was just wondering, Masha, so this theorem one, does it extend to the case where the sender preferences might depend on the state? Um, I don't think so. I could not figure this out. It extends pretty well to uh, more actions of the receiver. It extends to multiple receivers who are independent of each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, as far as I know, it does not extend to not state independent references. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because there's no such thing, like the senders I see constraint, I don't know how to write that down. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, theorem one is actually really useful because it allows us to uh, pretty painlessly um, characterize the full equilibrium set. How? Well, we just now need to look at uh, all the subsets of the unit interval that satisfy the two constraints. So pretty straightforward. I'm gonna rank equilibrium in terms of ex ante utility of the sender, which is actually the same as his ex ante odds of approval. Why? Because you get one if receiver approves zero otherwise. And we have also a nice formula for that. Uh, the ex ante utility is just the prior measure of the set of approved states, right? So this is the formula. All right, so uh, let's first look at the sender worst equilibrium outcome. So this is the one in which sender's utility is uh, the, the smallest across all equilibria. And so we're kind of looking for the smallest in terms of prior measure, set of approved states, W lower bar. And because set of approved states cannot possibly be smaller than the receiver's complete information approval set, they're just gonna equal to each other. Now, this is interesting because if you think of it from the point of view of the receiver, the receiver approves if and only if the state of the world is within her complete information approval set. So the fact that the receiver is making a fully informed choice. So uh, this equilibrium outcome is actually equivalent to uh, full disclosure, also known as full unraveling in the literature. And you know it's been known for 40 years now that that's something that happens in verifiable games. Um, kind of an interesting fact, though, is if you look at all these papers, usually the way they would talk about full disclosure is, you know, in every state of the world, the sender truthfully and fully reveals the state, which is one way to implement it. But another way to implement it would be directly with just two messages, right? So one message would be, dear receiver, the state of the world is within your complete information approval set. Receiver hears it is like, oh, gee, thank you. I believe you because your messages are verifiable. I'm going to approve. And then the second message would be, dear receiver, the state of the world is not within your complete information approval set. And then the receiver is like, well, thanks anyway, I'm going to reject. Okay, so this is kind of an alternative way of implementing the same outcome with just two messages. 
So that's standard worst equilibrium. Now, what about standard preferred equilibrium? So here we're going to be maximizing uh, standards example utility across all equilibria. And um, roughly speaking, we're going to be looking for largest in terms of prior measure set of approved states W upper bar. And so now it's actually going to be the obedience constraint that's going to be binding. So um, here's the actual solution. So um, that's my second result, second and last result. Uh, so the standard preferred equilibrium set of root states W upper bar is going to be characterized by a cutoff value. Of the receiver's net pay of approval. So the receiver is going to be approving all the states uh, which is with, with a sufficiently high but possibly negative net pay of approval. And then she's going to be rejecting all the other states. And then basically delta is um, exactly equal to C star, then, you know, it could be either. We'll talk about it in a second. And then why does this happen? Basically, you know, there are some good states from the point of view of the receiver and some bad states. The good states have positive delta, the bad states have negative delta. Now, how does, how does the sender convince the receiver? Well, he takes all the, all the good states with the positive delta and pulls them together with the states with the negative delta. Now, how many negative delta states can he add? Well, probably not all of them, right? So at some point he's gonna stop. When is he gonna stop? When the receiver is gonna be indifferent. So when delta is on average exactly equal to zero. So this is actually how I got a job at Vanderbilt. I pulled all the good information about myself, like I'm a good teacher with all the bad information about myself, like that I'm a theorist. And then, you know, on average they were indifferent. And then I assumed that they were gonna break ties in favor of hiring me and then they did. So, uh, you know, this sounds stupid, but it's actually kind of like the solution um, they talk about in Bayesian persuasion, right? So you pull as many bad states with the good states until the receiver is exactly indifferent. Sounds very familiar and that's because it is. So. This is exactly the same solution that we would get with commitment. So um, now let me prove this, doing good on time. So the first part is that the equilibrium, the standard preferred equilibrium outcome is gonna feature a cutoff uh, state. So uh, on the top is just the problem, right? So we're maximizing the example utility subject to the uh, sender's IC constraint and the receiver's obedience constraint. Right, so um, looks a bit different than before, but basically it still just says that on average delta is non-negative. Now, this is uh, not a formal proof. Formal proof is in the paper. This is like how we would do this if the state space was discrete. So um, think about like what states do you add to the set of approval states? What happens when you, when you add a state omega? Well, adding omega has a benefit of the prior uh, of P of omega, because that's by how much uh, your example utility is gonna increase. And then it has a cost in terms of obedience constraint of delta P, right? So positive deltas are good, they loosen your constraint, negative deltas are bad. The opposite of loosen your constraint. So basically just from this observation, two things follow immediately. First of all, you should definitely prioritize and add those states that have positive delta because they loosen your constraint. Uh, this is actually great news because it just says that whenever you're maximizing the objective subject to just the obedience constraint, your IC constraint is going to automatically fold. You no longer have to worry about it. And the second thing you can observe is if you have two states with different deltas, then you should first add the state with a higher delta, so with a less negative delta. Okay, so these two observations just, just, tell, just tell us that it's going to be a cutoff structure uh, of the equilibrium. And then why is the obedience constraint going to bind? Well, because if it doesn't bind, then you can add, add more states, improve the objective while still satisfying the constraint. Okay, so now we know that the sender preferred equilibrium outcome is going to have a cutoff uh, for the sender's net payable, uh, receiver's net payable pool. Uh, now onto the interesting part. So the part that proves that the standard preferred equilibrium outcome is gonna be a commitment outcome. So um, basically we proved this by looking for a really long time at both problems. Okay, so on the right, we have the problem of finding the commitment outcome and it just comes straight out of the definition. This is our ex-ante utility, which we maximize. Then we have the obedience constraint, 
which features alpha times delta times p, it has to be non-negative. And then um, our final constraint was that the outcome alpha has to be between zero and one for every omega. Okay, so this is just from definition. And I was just trying to write down the problem of finding standard preferred equilibrium outcome that looks as close as possible to the problem on the right. Okay, so actually <clears throat> uh, we're still maximizing the standards example utility. So that's the same. We're still gonna have the obedience constraint is the same, except it's just written in terms of alpha and not in terms of W, but you know, it's equivalent. But now here's the kicker, the equilibrium outcome has to be deterministic. Okay, so now we have this additional restriction that actually alpha cannot be between zero and one, it has to be zero or one. So this is the first major difference. And this is actually the roadblock that we uh, ran into in the motivating example. We had those three sevenths of the innocent who were convicted and that was okay for the commitment outcome, but we could not reach that in an equilibrium outcome because it has to be deterministic. And then technically we have another condition for in equilibrium, which is the Sanders IC constraint. The reason I don't write it down here was because we just um, figured out on the previous slide that if we're just maximizing example utility subject to obedience, it's gonna be uh, satisfied automatically. So actually the only difference between two problems is deterministic versus not. And <clears throat> We've already seen that if the state space is binary, actually, this is gonna play a role. So uh, it's the continuous state space specifically that's gonna allow us um, to have the same solution for both problems. Um, and so I proved this essentially with a purification argument. Okay, so I take some uh, non-deterministic commitment outcome. Why is it non-deterministic? Because there's some set on which the sender is recommending both actions. Right, so receiver takes both actions with positive probability. Now, why does the sender do it? What, why is he mixing? Well, he's mixing because he's indifferent. When is he indifferent? He's indifferent when for all of these states, the cost of adding them to the set of approved states is actually the same, okay? So actually for all of these states, delta has to be constant. So this is a very useful observation because what we can do now is we could just partition the set D into two, X and Y. So on D we were sending a mixed recommendation, but now we're gonna purify it and just recommend approval on X and recommend rejection on Y. And then uh, basically continuity of the state space allows us to do this. So we could do this uh, without affecting example utility, without affecting the obedience constraint, so we basically, we have purified this com commitment outcome and we have showed that there always exists a de deterministic commitment outcome. We also know that it has to satisfy the sender's IC constraint, which now makes it also an equilibrium outcome, which equilibrium outcome is gonna be the sender preferred equilibrium outcome. So um, that was the proof. Now, um, example, back to the example, right? So, um, Again, here's our uh, state space. Uh, in blue is the judge's approval set. In black is the judge's net pay of approval. Um, what are we doing? We're looking for the sender preferred equilibrium. Now recall that uh, for, for the purposes of this example, we assume uniform prior. Um, and that's a very useful assumption because it makes things much simpler. Now we, we are maximizing effectively just the length of W, well, length if it's an interval, you know, otherwise maybe sum of lengths if it's not, subject to the obedience constraint, which I'm just saying that is gonna bind because we know that. And the obedience constraint now just says that the integral of delta over W should be zero, okay? So how do we find W? Well, let's just assume it's gonna be an interval. And so exactly how far can we push it? Right, so we know that the people who stole at least 70 cars are gonna be convicted. Now, how many of the innocent can we also convict? Well, the obedience constraint says that delta should integrate to zero, right? So this positive area should equal to this negative area. Conveniently, the heights of these rectangles are the same. So for them to equal, the lengths also need to be the same. So the length of this positive one is 0.3, which means that the length of this negative one should also be 0.3. 
which gives us the uh, sender preferred set of approved states that starts at point four and ends at one. Okay, so that's the solution to the sender's problem. Asha, so it's just one of the solutions, right? So you're yeah, just picking yeah. an interval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's because it's, uh, it's kind of nice to talk about it, but because, you know, there's delta is constant here, we could have had like it here, this negative part. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so there's a few th few very interesting things about this equilibrium. So first of all, we've reached the same commitment outcome as in the motivating example. Judge convicts sixty percent of the defendants, even though seventy percent of them are innocent. Why sixty? Well, because from point four to one, all the people who stole forty cars or more are going to jail. Seventy percent of them are innocent because ex ante seventy percent of them were innocent. Now. Another interesting thing here is the implementation. In my opinion, the implementation of the sender preferred equilibrium is easier to understand the, than the implementation of the commitment outcome. So how do we implement this? Well, we implement this with just two messages, right? So um, whenever the judge learns that the defendant stole at least 40 cars, he tells, so whenever the prosecutor learns that the defendant stole at least 40 cars, he tells the judge, the defendant stole at least 40 cars. So he just sends that message whenever it's true. And then whenever he learns that the defendant stole less than 40 cars, he says, the defendant stole less than 40 cars. Okay, so for every defendant who stole say 50 cars, 60 cars, 70, 80, 90, 100, always the same message is being sent. Now. Let's think about the judge. Well, the judge has a uniform prior on the entire unit interval. What happens when she hears the message that the defendant stole at least 40 cars? Well, she now knows that the, the new support should be from point four to one. But actually she doesn't learn anything beyond that. So now her posterior is uniform from point four to one. Because actually for all of these defendants, the sender is sending the same message. So now what's her posterior mean? Well, her posterior mean conveniently, and this is not a coincidence, is gonna be exactly 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is just enough for her to convict. So she convicts. Okay, so this is uh, kind of going back to Andrew's very early question about kind of interpretation of messages. Here, for every defendant that comes in, uh, who stole 40 cars or more, the defendant just, you know, brings exactly 40 video recordings of cars being stolen, but, you know, doesn't prove anything beyond 40. And so that's how you reach the commitment outcome with just verifiable messages. Um, I, mean, so, I mean, not that, I mean, not, obviously it's just a, it's just an example to make the point clear. Um, but I'm sorry, like, I mean, what, what would that even look like to like provide evidence that 40% of cars are stolen without the constituent parts? I guess I, 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 I like it, it's a little hard for me to see. Uh, like, or it's like, how, how would you verify that at least 40% of cars are stolen without knowing whether each individual car is stolen? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously it's not like <laughs> super important. No, 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 obviously, I mean, this is just the best yeah. example I could think of. But what I was thinking is like, literally you know you you know how many cars the defendant stole like how would you know like suppose that there's like cctv for everything and you just have access to it so whenever uh, a defendant stole 100 cars you just pick 40 uh, random occurrences and show that evidence to the judge you know whenever it's 50 you pick any 40 and show that to the judge so whenever we would verify the claim that they stole at least 40 cars. Is that? Yeah, I guess, so. yeah, just we need to, if you can think of some way to map this to a scenario where it's again, like it's like individual examples are the thing which are, which are verifiable. Um, right, yeah, no, possible. I agree. It, it, it seems totally possible that, that that does map on here. It's just, it's just not obvious. Okay, yeah, I think more about it, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, can I add something? So this discussion made me realize that I'll... So up to this point, I thought that you were getting some kick out of this particular communication role that you have chosen, which is 
W has to be within this, omega has to be within the set that you send, but nothing else. An alternative communication protocol, right? You can send like lower messages, but not higher messages and etc. I feel like it's gonna give the same result here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you could you could you could restrict the message space further, and you would still get the same result. Yeah, yeah. For example, you you could uh, you could as a sender select kind of the threshold, and then the two possible messages would be at least that or at most that. Yeah, but this would be making the model kind of more specific. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me just talk a little bit about robustness because uh, I want to be very honest about that. Uh, and about robustness, there's some, but not all of it. So uh, one way to generalize the model is to have many receivers who are independent, right? So we're going to have a set of receivers with a common prior. We have a sender with state independent preferences. So it just depends on uh, the set of receivers who approve then weekly increases in each receiver's action, right? So for example, product sales or now convincing multiple voters, convincing the jury and so on. And then uh, we, if we assume, and then we also need to assume that the receivers are basically completely independent. So communication is in private. And then also uh, receivers do not interact. They do not play a game. Meaning that uh, each receiver has, you know, her own net pay of approval, her own approval set, but um, you know, receiver's approval set does not depend on other receiver's approval sets. And then uh, in this, um, under these assumptions, both results go through. So we still have the direct implementation result, which is now we have a set of approved states for each receiver. And so this collection is gonna be an equilibrium collection of set of approved states, if and only if each W satisfies both constraints. So this also should be for all for all receivers. And then the center preferred equilibrium outcome is also still gonna be a commitment outcome. So here we have perfect uh, generalization. Now, uh, the way in which uh, the model does not really generalize, and so I'm working on this in a separate project with Denise Shishkin, uh, is when the receiver has three or more actions. Okay, so uh, what is the problem here? Uh, oh, and actually it's, it's props to Elliot for even noticing this. So the problem here is that um, say receiver has multiple actions. So they are choosing between um, say, I don't know, three actions, zero, one, and two. Um, then the receiver is gonna have a complete information approval set for each action, right? So these are just her preferences, what she wants to do under complete information. Then the outcome is now a partition into, you know, which action is taken in which state. This is a deterministic outcome. Uh, and then what would be the sender's incentive compatibility constraint? Well, if some set, uh, if, if in some state, the receiver wants to take action J under complete information, then in equilibrium, she should take at least action J, but possibly higher. So uh, the issue here is that this IC constraint could actually be violated in every commitment outcome, meaning that we're actually not gonna reach the same payoff. So the best intuition I can give you here is, uh, say you have a, like a salesman who um, has two products. One is like a cheaper product and, and one is a more important, uh, a more expensive product. So he prefers the, re the receiver to buy the most expensive product than medium product and then not buy at all. Now it's possible in Bayesian persuasion with commitment that the sender is actually gonna focus all of his energy on just always sending the medium product because for whatever reason that will maximize his utility. Now that commitment outcome is gonna violate the sender's IC constraint because actually the senders with the most expensive product would want to deviate. So um, binary action is really, really a special case uh, and the reason why we don't need to worry about the sender's IC constraint is because one action is, you know, unambiguously good for the sender, and the other action is unambiguously bad for the uh, for the sender. Would you would you have the same issue if the receiver say got um, some? I mean, I, I, I guess all the information gets revealed here. But if the receiver like also gets a, a separate um, exogenous signal, and then then in effect like their actions become a mapping from that signal to what they do. And then, 
so yeah, I mean, like the intuition there is like, oh, I'm like worried that the receiver is going to get this like unfavorable action. So I really need to, you know, give them all the best information. Um, it kind of like, yeah, it's like having the best information to, to get them to do what I want, even if they get a bad private signal is like, I want them to purchase the expensive thing. I don't know if that, that analogy totally works, but. Right. Uh, I actually have not thought at all, at all about it, but uh, I will. So thank you for this comment. Um, uh, okay. One thing I should say is like, not all hope is lost. Like once you do know the commitment outcome, it's actually very easy to check if it's implementable in equilibrium by just checking the IC constraint. So it's not completely useless. All right. So I have one minute. So to conclude, uh, I solve persuasion games with verifiable information. So I proved the direct implementation result that basically tells us what can happen in equilibrium. So a set of approved state is going to be implementable in equilibrium if and only if it satisfies the obedience and the IC constraints. And then the set of equilibrium outcomes goes from full disclosure all the way to the commitment outcome. Now, the most controversial slide of today is, uh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate um, you attending and please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Masha. Um, Elliot, Andrew, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I'm just I'm I'm happy to hear you're you're working on that extension. That that just that just seems important, right? Because yeah. um, you know, it's just like the standard unraveling intuition is just you know I always want them to to think I'm a little bit better, and and in some way you're you know it's like you're shutting down the standard unraveling mechanism by having this indifference um, yeah. over a lot of different states. Um, yeah. But, and yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I kind of wonder if there's, um, but if there's some intermediate ground there where, so like in some sense, um, so it, you know, if, if there was like weak preferences over, over, you know, you thinking I'm good versus great, like in some sense, the commitment seems easier. And it's like, you know, I only need to, I don't need to restrain myself to not getting you to do what I want. I only need to restrain myself to, you know, get you to think that I'm that I'm pretty good rather than thinking I'm the best. I'm in fact the best. So I think, mm -hmm. like in some sense, I think you've like solved one extreme version where you know this commitment equals verifiable information, and then you know there's there's another extreme where where if you know I really just want you to think I'm as good as possible, then then you know then full unraveling happens, and right. it seems like there yeah. has to be a middle ground there where there's like you need a bit of yeah. commitment power if you have verifiability, and that they can sort of substitute each other. Yep. Yep, that's like one of the directions we're thinking about. Another direction is like almost kind of like approximating many actions with two. Uh, but it, it becomes really complicated, like surprisingly so, even with three actions. Yeah, thanks. It's, for, it's a really fun, it's a very, very, like very clear and uh, uh, fun, fun paper and presentation, so. Thank you. Masha, um, so, Kind of so related to the unraveling thing. So so unlike the kind of the continuous action, uh, everything strictly ordered, um, sort of classic unraveling setting. Um, so you have equilibria other than full information, and that are not even outcome equivalents to full information for the receiver. Um, uh, but there is still a full information equilibrium in your set. Yep. Right? Um, yep. And, and so, but it's, so something else that sort of jumped out at me is it's, it's the worst equilibrium uh, for the sender in your setting, right? Yep. Um, and so I guess I'm kind of, I'm wondering if you have a sense of how general that is. So it's sort of, to, to what extent can you go beyond the setting in which we get the strongest unraveling result keep things ordered and get this result that full information is the worst equilibrium for the center. So I think that, uh, let me think about this. Um, I think the full disclosure is kind of always the center worst equilibrium just because your, like all your IC constraints are gonna bind. So that's, that's gonna be true with multiple receivers. There's gonna be true with multiple actions of one receiver too. Right, I guess as you're saying kind of sort of this, you look at in like, uh, as long as I can, as long as I can certify my exact type, 
uh, the payoff yeah, yeah. that I would get in the in under full disclosure is always available to me. Uh, uh, and so yes. in any equilibrium, I have to be getting better than it or else I would deviate to it. Okay, yeah, so it's- Yep, yep. Uh, Okay, cool. Um, Which is unfortunate because that's, that, that really, that that's really the the key for why with more actions uh, you may not reach the commitment outcome. Yeah. But on the sort of bright side, you know, I'm I try to be optimistic. On the sort of bright side, it's actually pretty easy to check whether a commitment outcome is an equilibrium outcome because you just need to take you just need to only check whether the sender wants to deviate to full disclosure and nothing else. Right. Um, the, but I guess this is for a particular commitment solution, because if you have a lot of, yeah, uh, if you have multiple, then yes. Yeah. Yep. The, um, but okay. Huh. Um, and the thing you and Dennis are working on is like, it's, it, is it like looking at sender optimal equilibrium with multiple actions or? Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Should I stop sharing? Uh, yes, yes, you can do that. Um, it, Elliot, I think you were done, right? Um, uh, does anybody else want to ask questions, make comments? Um, There's a hand raised. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. I can't see it, but... Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, nobody else is asking question. Uh, so this is me. Nice to meet you, Marsha. So virtually. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, maybe uh, bring up another controversial topic, maybe uh, uh, regarding uh, equilibrium refinement, right? So so you have multiple equilibrium outcomes uh, in the uh, uh, so-called disclosure game, I would say. And uh, uh, have you thought about maybe uh, using uh, uh, equilibrium refinement to say maybe which one is uh, you think is more plausible. Even, even in the uh, Milgram paper, he, he used the refinement to say, okay, unraveling is the most plausible outcome, right? So maybe in your case, do, do, would you find maybe the uh, sender preferred is somehow more plausible? So using- uh, Right, sender. so th that's okay. a very good point. That was actually three years of my life in grad school because my advisor was Joel Sobel, and he really, really likes iterated deletion of weakly dominated strategies. And it turns out that actually the only equilibrium outcome that survives that is full unraveling, uh, which is um, kind of bad news for me. So um, yeah, with, with I think with some others, it's also like the center preferred equilibrium outcome would kind of be the first to go. Uh, but I still, like it because there's a sense in which the sender kind of reveals the least amount of information. So for example, maybe if you restricted the message space, you know, to only allowing to, for example, just send messages that include a cutoff, or if you include some kind of preference for being vague, you know, if it's a politician, perhaps he wants to reveal as little information as possible. So, or, or perhaps being more specific is more costly because you have to physically present more evidence. So with, with, a, with, a, with some modifications like that, it's actually going to be the sender preferred equilibrium outcome that's going to be the only one to survive. So yeah, it really depends on what, what you're looking for. There's arguments for both uh, extremes. Thank you so much. I think Arda said something like costly verification is another possibility here. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, it's like, yeah, ba basically making the more vague message cheaper somehow would would select the sender preferred equilibrium outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not to keep harping on it, but I think that also goes back to this, like, what's verifiable question that I think that yeah. like, I think there's some settings where just like, you know, revealing the state is like the simplest measures to send, you know, just like this is the truth. Um, you know, there, there's other scenarios where if it's like inherently a multi-dimensional setting where like fully revealing the state is actually very costly. It's like, you know, here's exactly what's yep. in my healthcare bill, you know, like that, yeah. that's like incredibly costly to reveal all that. And yep. so you might just say, you know, you know, you get to keep your doctor or something, you know, there, there's like simpler messages that are easier to send. So I, I don't know if yep. there's any papers that, that do this, but that might be something else interesting to explore of like, you know, when, what, what's easy to verify in some sense. 
thank you. Angel and Constantine, I, I, I don't remember which one is the order, so maybe we'll just go in alphabetical. Angel first and Constantine <laughs> later. Okay, so thank you. So thank you, Masha, for the talk. So uh, if I remember it right, I mean, in the literature that they talk about unraveling, it is crucial the assumption that this common knowledge that the sender uh, knows the state. Whereas in yep. your case, that's not important, isn't it? I mean, you can basically no, no, general. It's... No, the sender needs to know the state, yeah. But he doesn't it... need that is common knowledge that he knows the state. As far as I see, I mean, everything seems to go through, even if it's not common knowledge that he knows the state. So that with certain probability, he knows the state, and with some probability, he doesn't right. know the state. I think that everything goes through. I mean, all the uh, results that you presented today. I never thought about it, but I, I think you're right. But I need to check before I completely agree with you, but I, I, I think you're right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great talk. Just one one small follow up. Maybe I missed it in the beginning. Yeah, hi, hi again. Yeah, is it is it equivalent to just like interval disclosure, or or it's not? Right? When I'm just kind of restricted to revealing revealing a set in which the true state is contained, well, a measurable set in which true state is contained, and that's it. So uh, good to see you again, but uh, it does not need to be an interval for sure oh, so it was, any set any set yeah it's it, it has to be a set yeah that's verifiable yes yeah okay uh and here you basically there is no kind of uh private information on the other side right so this one side knows everything another side knows nothing yes right and uh kind of with this like kind of interval restriction there is no trivial extension uh, to the situation when uh, the other side has some ideas. I'd imagine that they also have some signal or they have some partition. Um, so right. I, know, I, know, I know it's a hard thing to do in general, right? But maybe specifically under your restrictions, it might be easier to do than in a general case. Right, right, right. So, so you mean like if uh, if the receiver also maybe like not really learns the state of the world fully, but maybe learns a partition or something. Yeah, or maybe or kind of the classical example would be I get some signal, right, that somehow correlates with the true state of the world, and kind of the distribution mm -hmm. is known. Or maybe maybe even the signal itself is known, right? So there are two specifications, right? When some information is hidden, and another specification is that when uh, some information must be revealed. Right. Yeah, I, I, that's not something I have done, so um, no, it's, I don't know the answer, but it's something that's worth uh, researching, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we're two minutes away from uh, the end, so if anybody has a quick question, um, otherwise we can move to uh, the virtual, uh, virtual chair. Um, by the way, the link is in the chat everyone if you want to join us so just make sure you need to leave zoom in order to um because uh you need the mic um, audio and video there but um once we left zoom you can just join us there uh anybody else okay well then uh masha thank you very much andrew elliot thank you very much um it was great hope to see you uh, in the virtual chair um, and uh, see you next week.